Hi everyone and welcome to the Vinari podcast. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Paola Dalstalva and I lead our R&D offering at Vinari Partners with a focus on neuroscience and rare disease. So today as part of our R&D hiring strategy series, I'm joined by Dr. Dean Carson, CNS leader currently at Atai, where he leads two programs developing innovative psychiatric therapeutics. Dean has held multiple operational, clinical and scientific leadership roles and this has resulted in successful exits, funding and drug approvals. Today, we will be discussing the age-old question of how to best build leadership teams in such a challenging space as CNS. Hi, Dean. Great to have you here. Thanks, Paula. I would love it, Dean, if maybe we could start off with a brief introduction to your experience and, and your role currently. Yeah, so uh, I'm a neuroscientist and psychopharmacologist by training. Um, I did my PhD at the University of Sydney in Australia, where I'm originally from. Um, I've been in the States now for 13 years. I did my postdoctoral training at Stanford University in psychiatry and behavioral sciences. Um, and I left academia and have been in industry working largely for small early stage biotech companies. I've held a number of different positions uh, spanning R&D, uh, early stage, preclinical you know, development, um, all the way through to uh, mid to late stage clinical trials. Also, um, extensive work on the management side and involved in uh, fundraising and positioning companies to expand uh, in their scope. You have such strong experience in, in CNS, and I don't think it's a secret to anybody that the neuroscience space is a tricky one to lead, you know, so high risk, high reward. What are your thoughts on how hiring might differ in this space compared to other therapeutic areas? Yeah, and I mean, in all honesty, I for uh, many years in industry avoided psychiatry, um, largely because of the complexities with uh, drug development, high failure rate, um, you know, soft endpoints in your clinical trials, difficulty raising funds, many large companies um, kind of deprioritizing their uh, development plans within the space. So I do have a, a broad uh, background in, in other areas, uh, endocrinology, metabolism, uh, rare disease, neurology, even um, less risky than, than psychiatry. Um, but I think that uh, as we've progressed as a society, we're seeing a, more and more of an unmet need. And so there is you know, federal funding, there's VC funding and there's more interest now from large pharma to put resources towards trying to find solutions to these problems. So I think that is also allowing for people like myself that have had an interest and a training background in that space to feel more comfortable entering into that field. I mean, aside from looking for people with technical backgrounds in, you know, either neuroscience, neurology, psychiatry, would you say there's a certain subsection of soft skills that you'd be looking for to, to hire people into this space? I believe that there's a framework to follow for drug development that doesn't really deviate between um, indication areas. I think that there's an interest that people have either through their own personal experiences or just through their observations of, you know, living on this planet. Um and that certainly is a motivator for people to want to develop drugs that can provide solutions to people that have this, uh, you know, kind of broadening uh, mental health issue. Uh, but no, I, I don't see that there's necessarily a soft skill that's specific to psychiatry that's different than any other area of drug development. So seeing as you have moved across these different therapeutic areas, Dean, and, and have been in neuroscience for a while, do you think the way that we look at hiring into the CNS neurology or psychiatry space has changed these past years now that we do have a lot more investor focus on this? Yes. And I think for the reason that we know more now than what we did 10 years ago. So the knowledge base that's expected for the people that would be mm -hmm. suitable to be hired into senior leadership positions, the bar is set much higher. Gone are the days that you could kind of say, we don't know, you know, it's a, the brain is a black box and it's, we now have a lot more information. And I think that there's an expectation that people have a more sophisticated view of the space in general. And so when we're hiring those people, it's not just, do you have your, you know, drug development chops that you've, you've had from other areas, but do you also understand the complexities and the nuances of 
any area within neuroscience that's going to support bringing drugs to market. How would you marry that, though, with companies that are looking to innovate? You know, you're not going to find someone who's done 20 years in a specific therapeutic area with a new modality. What, where would you prioritize? Yeah, I, I think um, certainly there are a number of companies that uh, have been focusing on the neuro, neuroscience space um, where internally they've been developing those skill sets. And so there are subject matter experts that are sitting within their um, staffing pool already now. Um, but it's also people coming over from academia. Maybe it's just time for a career transition or whatever it might be. But trying to find, um, you know, psychiatrists, neurologists, neuroscientists, psychopharmacologists, et cetera, et cetera, that are bringing together a, a diverse um, kind of uh, framework to make this more realistic of bringing drugs to market. Because otherwise we're seeing, you know, people stagnate and just going over the same uh, approach to drug development for an area that has been unsuccessful for a long time. I'm quite curious to hear your thoughts on hiring into this space from larger organizations versus smaller organizations where yeah what, what are your thoughts? It really is uh, what do people want at, at certain points in their career I think that we see a lot of um, it going both ways where you've got people that have spent a lot of time in biotech that may be looking for more security more stability and more structure um, over a longer period of time especially in this area era where we see a lot of layoffs happening kind of out of the blue we've just got you know financial downturns with within the sector uh, and a large number of companies going bust so there's that kind of appeal for people to move into the big pharma space but then on the other side it's people that have been in big pharma maybe have established themselves have a really good track record and they want something that's more challenging. They've got that risk appetite um, and they're willing to take the risk. So they they will switch back that way. And it's of benefit both ways. We need to have, um, you know, small biotech be more structured and, and people within the organization that have the longer view of things where they've had success at big pharma companies. And then big pharma also wants to have more innovation and more drive in people that have come from a more nimble environment. So, Dean, I would love to know from your standpoint, if you had to pick one single most important aspect of hiring the right people for the CNS space, what would you pick? Yeah, it's a really good question. It is something that I've thought about a lot based on my own personal experience in this industry, um, as well as those of, of my colleagues. And I think resilience is the key. So it's important both for um, employees and employers. And it's also important for investors just to understand that this is an incredibly high failure rate portion of the industry. And it's a high failure rate because it's the single most complicated aspect of medicine and is why there's the highest unmet need. So I think as we progress, um, as long as people do remain resilient, there will be breakthroughs and it will become more stable. But at this point in time, it's still uh, an uncertain area and people have to have a tolerance for that. How do you expect the way that we hire for this space to change over the next 10 years? I think that it's going to be completely day by day. You know, certainly with like the introduction of AI, there's going to be a reduction in staffing needs for a particular, you know, uh, areas within the industry that might be easier to automate, um, you know, strategy level understanding where we're seeing the need for trailblazers to be able to um, blaze a new path towards approvals where there haven't been a large number of approvals or at least not with anything that's super novel. So maybe what we would see is um, a more of a focus on, kind of strategic level guidance for the direction that this industry or this segment of the industry is going. But I don't think that it differs necessarily from any other area. It's just drug development is inherently risky. People need to have an appetite for that risk. Um, and they're rewarded by potential financial return, but also just the fascinating things that we do in this space. Thank you so much, Dean, for, for coming on today. It's been an absolute pleasure hearing about your insights into the R&D hiring space. Thank you for having me.